Hi, Mayor Christian Olson. I'm here on behalf of Harvard Chan Sea Change and the Environmental Media Association, where I serve on the board of directors. This is part of a series I host called EMA Talks Real Science, where we give our viewers the opportunity to hear directly from scientists on important climate equity, environmental, and public health issues. Today, we are having a conversation with Dr. K. Vish, Vishwanath, on effective climate communications, not just climate communications, effective climate communications. Vish is the Lee Kum Ki Professor of Health Communications in the Department of Social and Behavioral Science at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and in the McGraw-Patterson Center for Population Sciences at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. He is also the Faculty Director of Health Communications Corps at Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center. Previously, he was the Director of Center for Translational Communication Science and the Director of Harvard Chan India Research Center. Oh my God, if anyone can save us, it's going to be you. Thank you for uh, for coming on today. Thank you, and that was a very generous introduction. <laughs> and <laughs> oh, so I didn't read the whole thing, you know. So. Uh, yeah, but it was true. So I, I wanted to make sure I put it all in there because that's half of what we're going to be talking about today. Is you know we're rocking the first pandemic during the social media age, and so how important it is to get our information from people um, that carry the science and carry the data versus carrying an alternative motive. But let's go back to the basics first. Um, I just wanna talk, you know, because it's you, and we talk about climate change a lot, and that's a, a, obviously a very broad term. Uh, can you begin by explaining what exactly that means, climate change? Uh, it, it's very interesting you are starting off with that question. Uh, so the reason is there is a technically, scientifically correct definition, I think, uh, right? And then there is this, popular impression of what climate change communications is. Um, so, tell us the difference, that's why we're here. <laughs> so, you know, technically uh, it is supposed to be, and I'm going to screw up because I'm not a climate uh, change scientist, nor do I play one on TV. Uh, a, a, a climate change communication is, you know, uh, uh, around climate change, you know, the notion of long-term changes in weather patterns, uh, you know, that has uh, increased uh, global temperatures, at least the surface temperatures of Earth, yep. uh, as a result of uh, uh, human uh, usage of fossil fuels. Uh, uh, that's one definition that is often uh, used, uh, and of course there are variations to that. And that is probably uh, uh, maybe an orthodox climate communication person or a climate change person may disagree with me, but that is somewhat closer to the technical definition. But my, uh, the reason I'm mentioning there's a popular impression is if we ask people, you know, what is climate change, uh, then we have trouble uh, because it means many things to many people. Right. Uh, and, and that's where I think, you know, we see the gap. Uh, and also the question is, you know, uh, from a communication perspective, how do we communicate, uh, you know, or translate uh, this uh, kind of a very technical uh, definition that is very contextual uh, to uh, something that an ordinary person on the street, regular people uh, understand. Do you want to give a shot at that right now? Do you want to do your version of that, what that means? Uh, you know, uh, I'm tempted to, but I think it is difficult. I, I think uh, in, uh, trying to uh, you know, because uh, it is, uh, uh, Eric, it is so contextual, you know, yeah. Um, so if you if you ask people in Texas today, uh, you know they will tell you uh, you know what climate change is and how that is being communicated to them uh, all all along, including different types of communications uh, from the politicians in Texas today uh, to people and 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 material meteorologists uh, compared to what they're experiencing. Right. So I, uh, uh, so to me, I think. Uh, uh, something technical like that uh, has to be the definition that, are, are, if you will, the characterization of what it is will have to be contextualized to their day-to-day -day experiences. Uh, otherwise, the technical definition itself uh, means very little. I think. Absolutely. You know? Interesting. And why do you, so why is that? Why have people struggled so much to effectively communicate like impacts and the importance of taking action on climate change? Like what is that about us that make it make, that makes that so difficult for us? You know, it is a great question. I don't think it is one thing, right? So we started off with global warming. Uh, it's very difficult to talk about global warming in Texas today or anywhere in South. 
uh, and so it, it uh, one of the reasons I think that the 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 difficulty we have maybe I will offer uh, three reasons, and I, you know you can um, you know uh, uh, don't uh, want to make it too complex. But one is the thing that the abstractness of what climate change means, right? And also it's difficult to grasp because it's not intuitive. Uh, you know, uh, if you tell me, you know, as it is happening in Boston today, there is likely to be a snowstorm and you connect it to me directly in my day-to-day -day life, I may be able to grasp it, but yeah. climate change by itself is so abstract uh, and it is uh, technically, as we were discussing, you know, supposed to be felt over decades. Um, I don't, as a human being, think in terms of decades, you know, yeah. as a human being, I think in short you know, spans of times, uh, maybe today, next week at the most, or next year, uh, or last year and last week, but not uh, in, in such a complex way. I think the second problem, you know, uh, I mean, uh, in, term, in addition to abstract, the second problem is causality of it. You know, we are very, our lives are complicated. You know, all of us are very busy lives and lives are complicated. And, and, and attributing causality is very difficult. You know, we do it in a very uh, lay person terms. You know, the weather is, the, you know, the sky is darker. Uh, today, I see some storms, I mean, some clouds, uh, which are darker in the distance. So I say, oh, it is likely to rain. Uh, I'll carry an umbrella with me, right? Yeah. I'm not proposing a complex scientific hypothesis here. Right. I'm going by intuition, I'm going by experience. So if somebody says, you know, climate change is leading to these broad weather patterns, you know, uh, snowstorms in Texas, floods, uh, uh, very powerful hurricanes, drought in Africa, it's, it's very difficult, you know, it's very difficult for me to make that kind of a causal chain of reasoning and attribution. Uh, and, and the third reason is, um, uh, we just began talking about it earlier, the politicization of it. Yeah. You know, if there is one consensus-based definition, then it's a little bit easier for me, but we have politicized the issue so much, including today uh, in the recent events in Texas that uh, um, depending on what my ideology is, I might buy into it, I may not buy into it, you know, so. That's so interesting. And I think that goes, you know, leads me to my next question, which is that understanding how, um, political it's begin, who is the best messenger um, to communicate the effects and the solutions? Is that politicians? Is that scientists? Like how do we, understanding the complexity of what you just put forward, which is a lot of obstacles to even convey what it is, let alone how do we find solutions? Who's the best people to, to communicate those solutions? Right. So um, I didn't, uh, when I, uh, I was thinking, when I, when I started talking about the challenges in, in communicating too, I may be uh, communicating unintentionally that it's impossible to do anything. So that's not my intention. Uh, number one, impossible. I, uh, uh, you know, I think um, um, one bit of good news amidst all this, including the pandemic we are facing, our country and the world is facing, uh, as well as the, you know, in climate change, uh, which is much more longer term. Uh, one bit of good news is that scientists are still trusted all over the world. Survey after survey shows us that scientists have the highest credibility, right? So right. that's one bit of good news. But I must also say, uh, in all honesty, scientists are the worst communicators, you know? Uh, you know, it is that apocryphal story about Harry Truman, right? You know, you know give me an economist with only one hand because, you know, economists tell him, you know, on the one hand, this is likely to happen, but on the other hand, something yeah, else yeah, is likely yeah. to happen. You know, if I'm a regular citizen, that confuses the heck out of me. I, you know, don't tell me all this gray stuff. Give me black and white. Give me something in black and white terms. And in that sense, some scientists are brilliant and they are so good at communicating. Uh, but mostly, I think, in a complex uh, topic where you are demanding something of people, uh, there are a couple of ways to do that. Certainly scientists, uh, certainly people such as you who can translate the science, the degree of comfort, you know, right. where who can, who are straddling these borders, right? To understand science, but to understand people, audiences, so to speak. Um, I'll take it, that as a compliment. 
I, I, it is meant as a compliment <laughs> uh, 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 and, and not flattering because I think it's important. I'll come back to that issue of, of why that is important in a second year. The, the, the other group of people are people who are closer to them. You know, we have to engage people who are closer to people, community-based organizations, mm -hmm. you know, with whom, in whom they trust a lot, our churches, our temples, uh, and our mosques. Uh, we trust our pastors, you know, we trust people who are closer to us with whom, to whom we go to for our problems and to the resolution of problems. Uh, so the, the, the and uh, um, uh, the storytellers, you know, this is a complex topic. And, and especially when it is a politicized topic, we need the storytellers, you know, to tell us uh, in the form of a story why this is a, a complex issue, why this is an important issue, why I need to act. No, That's a really good answer. And we're going to get into that. It is so funny because you talk about these people that are close to these people. And so much of that in the past has been these ideological groups um, based around faith. And what we've seen in the last 15 years is the hijacking of a lot of these ideological groups. And they use that faith to spread misinformation or in, I think in the word that I learned from you this morning, which is disinformation. So there is faith and there is faith. Uh, and, and certainly I think uh, we have seen um, in the case of pandemic, in the case of climate change, in the case of uh, women's health, uh, in a variety of conditions, uh, certainly religious figures have misled people, have been, um, have been um, um, less than honest uh, in, in the way they have communicated about important issues. But you also know that in certain groups, in certain communities, religious leaders have played an extremely important role. You know, yep. we have uh, been successfully able to be in the collective sense, uh, yep. been able to successfully vaccinate people in certain countries when we have enlisted the help of religious leaders yep. and have them, uh, you know, uh, spread the message because they have the credibility. Uh, so I think choosing the right partners uh, and the right people and working with them, right? Not working on them, but working with them a good can make too. a huge difference. Yeah, and that's that's to, to be defined. We're not working on them, working with them, because that's a difficult thing. Uh -huh. I think a lot of times when you're trying to convey information that you're not talking at, you're talking with. Right. Because right. nobody, and especially considering those types of groups that that kind of undermines the whole message and the necessity for connection. Right. Um, what do you think are the biggest obstacles to that, barriers to that? Right. I, I think a, a lot of these obstacles we are facing with climate change um, um, from a, a communication perspective is we are not engaging the right groups of people. I think it has been so far top-down communications. Uh, so we hear from national institutions, we hear from international institutions, whether it's financial institutions or uh, United Nations type institutions. But right. if I'm on the, uh, as I keep going back, uh, forgive me for using the same phrase, you know, but if I'm a person on the street, if I'm a regular person, I don't care what World Bank tells me. You know, it matters little to me what NASA tells me. I will enjoy what NASA is doing and I appreciate what they're doing uh, in landing on Mars or wherever. Uh, but at the end of the day, for me, you know, it's not the top-down communication. It is the horizontal communication where I am, you are convincing my networks, you yeah. know, my, my community organizations that I go to. Uh, and, and I don't, uh, uh, I should be careful. So I think that is the one that has not been done as much as it has been done in other movements we have seen, other yeah. grassroots movements we have seen, whether it's women's, uh, movement or, or uh, women's rights movement or whether it is uh, uh, you know civil rights movement etc um, because you know the I'll just make one more point on this it's very difficult if my life is affected by what you are saying about climate change and the policies you are proposing uh, if my life is affected it's very difficult for me to relate to somebody, Who's speaking from Geneva, you know? And my question is, what do they know about my life? Yeah. I have been a minor all my life. 
I come from the third generation of miners. You know, my father was a miner, my grandfather was a miner, and now you are telling me somehow mines will have to be closed, you know, and I will be jobless. Yeah. Um, and and that message is coming out of somewhere else. I think that top-down communication has been a significant deterrent for building that kind of a movement. That's so, yeah. That's really interesting. And absolutely right, if that's all I know. And I always think about this when I have conversations, even about immigration, which is that if I was born you know, in El Salvador and I had three kids, I would be on a train traveling to the US to fight for the best version of my family. And if you're a miner in West Virginia and you're the third generation in a coal, and this is how you put food on the table for your children, that becomes a very different conversation. The complexity of that is much more difficult to digest when spoken from a tower in Geneva. Right, right. Yeah. You raise a very important issue. I think that analogy you just said, right, is, is fundamental to some of the challenges we are facing right, right. now. So if you think about um, uh, what we say of the people um, who are in the mining business and are opposing, opposing this, you know, opposing immigration, opposing climate change, one of the approaches we have taken, we in the collective sense again, is to mock them, right, right, or to criticize them, or to label them, uh, and that is the worst thing you can do to communicate without understanding, uh, you know, uh, without that kind of empathy that yep. is necessary, yep. you know, to 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 communicate effectively. Empathy is one of the most critical, uh, you know, uh, mediators of effective communications. And how would, why would they believe me about climate change if I don't understand their life, if I did not walk in their footsteps? Um, you know, and that's where I think, you know, we are facing a challenge here. That's so smart. And that's a conversation. That's one of the things I love about these EMA talks is that I like to have them in a way that my seven-year-old can digest it. And when he has fights with his sister about something, that's the first thing we talk about is starting with empathy and immediately putting yourself in their shoes and their perspective and how that feels from them. And it's such a radical thing. Forget for kids, it's for all of us. And I think as we've become more isolated in our bubbles, it's become more and more difficult for us to empathize any contrasting views. And of course that makes it impossible for, for radical change. Um, Oh, this is fun. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, the social justice side of climate change. And when we talk about you know, vulnerable populations and how they're affected then by misinformation. So um, as it usually happens, whenever these events occur as a result of climate change, as a result of pandemics, um, different groups are affected disproportionately. You know, and we, we know this. Um, uh, you know, when, uh, uh, so when a hurricane, uh, you know, uh, when it, you know, lands and, and, and who are the people who suffer most, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it's not rocket science, you know, we know this, uh, that, that people who are, uh, you know, either underserved groups, you know, in some fashion, uh, whether it is minorities, racial or ethnic minorities, or people who are poorer, irrespective of their uh, skin color, are the other people who pay the price. And, and, and one of the things, and, and in fact, you and I were talking about the miners in West Virginia. Uh, at, uh, at, no, uh, and I think, so we need to think through what the, how do we actually communicate and define a solution with these groups in mind? You know, so because when, when whether there is a hurricane, uh, whether it is a, a winter storm as we are seeing in, in the South today, who, will, who is most likely to become homeless? Whose house is likely to be flooded? Who is less likely to have a generator uh, or, or freezer? I know uh, I can't go on a plane to Cancun. You know? I can't get on a plane go to Cancun. I, I have to suffer through if I am poor. And, and, and that makes it very difficult. As you know, uh, as well as anyone else, uh, the, 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 old, the entire concept of environmental justice, you know, is at the root of this because, uh, you know, and environmental racism, because we know that whether it is citing a pollution causing power plants uh, or, or other kinds of a, uh, you know, industries, uh, location of siting of industries, these are all done in poorer areas. Uh, and so these are the people who suffer most uh, 
Uh, and without enlisting, with, uh, number one, I think we need to really think through who suffers from climate change disproportionately, who will pay the price disproportionately if we impose solutions from the top, you yeah. know, uh, and then uh, enact our policies or design our policies, I think. So this is a huge, huge issue, as you are seeing in pandemic, in the case of pandemic. You know, uh, I have said this before, it took us three, four months to recognize that the pandemic is actually having a disproportionate impact on minorities. That is a collect that is a shame. It's a national embarrassment, yeah. you know, that it took us that long. And I'm, I'm saying, you know, if we don't get, get it right in the, in the area of climate change and how it affects certain groups, again, it will be, you know, inexcusable, I think. Yeah. No, and that's right. And that's a window into, you know, if you take the pandemic and you see how fast that happened and you're right, it's not, it, it doesn't cause the inequality. It reveals the inequality, those catastrophic events. And then if you look at climate change as a much bigger version of what we're talking about with the pandemic, we're going to see the same exact thing. And you're right. It is a, it is a, it is a shame on us, not only as a, as a country, but I think as a species as well. Um, uh, how, how do we how do we fight that? How do we fight um, the spread of, of misinformation, whether it be climate change, whether it be vaccines, you know, wh whatever that is? Right. I think there are there are some strategies we can use effectively. I think um, one. Um, um, so from a, um, um, I think when people don't have um, direct access to information that is reliable. Um, they are much more susceptible to uh, information that is unreliable. You know, uh, we have in our own work we have talked about this in the form of a somewhat not so sexy phrase, but it's you know communication inequalities. You know what we mean by inequalities? Communication inequalities. Yeah, what we mean by that is that uh, information and communication, like wealth, money, is unequally distributed. Our water, you know, uh, and some people have more access to information and have the greater capability to process that information and act on that information. You know, uh, one example is digital divide. Uh, digital divide is an issue. In fact, I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, one of the first politicians who talked about it is President Clinton, mm -hmm. talked about how computers can be differentially distributed based on income. This was in 90s when he was a president. Wow. And 20, uh, I mean, 30 years later, we are discussing that. We suddenly discovered certain poorer households have don't have access to broadband internet. But we have been talking about this. Why are we so shocked and surprised that certain poorer households have only one computer and no access to internet or intermittent access to broadband internet? And why are we shocked about it? Right? That is a clear inequality in communications and access to information, I think. So we need to address it uh, in order to, to really effectively communicate climate change, I think, you know, or anything for that matter. Number two, you know, uh, you, you and I started talking about this politicization of it. So when, especially if my livelihood is threatened and if my, and if I am being talked down to, my defensive reaction goes up. I am ready with my counter arguments with you, saying for everything you say, I'm ready to argue with you. But if you tell me in a form of a narrative, a story, right? And that's why I said earlier, why uh, people such as you are important, the storytelling. Storytelling, narrative approaches, you know, bring down the counter arguments because I'm absorbed in that story. We have very good evidence you know, that if I am absorbed in a story, if I watch a TV show, for that 30 minutes, 60 minutes, I am transported into that world. You know, I know it's a story, I know it's fiction, but for that amount of time, I'm completely transported. And I come back as one group of people who studied this said, in a changed person. I am less likely to counter argue. And movies, television shows, novels have been very effective, including Charles Dickens's novel. We can go way back, very effective in highlighting the injustices. You, you use the word revealing the inequalities, yeah. right? right? They're always there, but stories can be very good. This kind of a narrative engagement 
you know, to, to, to count, to lessen these counter arguments and to create engender empathy is very important, an important thing. Um, uh, I can go on and on. I can go. Uh, I, I mean, I, first off, I love that you have all you have points. You'll do. You're rocking a, a B, and then a subset a one, two, like that. The, you're speaking to the very organized part of my brain that I love. But let's let be, be while I have you on this topic. Can you give me examples of narrative? Um, uh, how you said it. It was so perfect. Uh, but the communication through narrative storytelling. Uh, mm -hmm. that you love, like that you would pass on to, if you were doing horizontal communication to pass on to your uncle or your aunt or your mm -hmm. sister, or your brother, what is an example of that? I think besides Charles Dickens in which you think they've communicated something that allows us to live in another POV. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are examples all around us. There are television shows that have been effectively used to talk about complex things like genetic testing. It's not easy, but you know, we have very successful television shows. Uh, we have television shows that talked about cancer and treatment of cancer, you know? Right. Um, uh, we have television shows that have talked about successfully about racial injustice, yep. the criminal justice system, right? All around us. Uh, it's something very complex like antiretroviral therapy. When there was resistance to ARVs because of AIDS, uh, you know, AIDS cocktail, which has uh, severe side effects, uh, um, um, uh, uh, international organizations have used just storyboards about one single person, yep. you know, ex using that person as an exemplar. So there are these kinds of narratives are all around us, whether it is movies, uh, whether it is television shows, whether it is novels, uh, or simple storyboards or ads, uh, you know, they have, so uh, essentially trying to use uh, that story you know, whether it is fictitious or non-fiction uh, to communicate, to bring it home, you know, it's just to bring it home and, and raise those emotions that are necessary. You know? Which is so interesting because I can name, my dad's an English professor and so much of my perspective as a kid that grew up in the Midwest in Iowa um, is based on literature. So my understanding of the complexity of the atrocities of the Holocaust was through Sophie's Choice. Um, to understand uh, racism in Chicago in the 40s, Native Son. To understand the AIDS crisis in New York in the 80s, uh, you know, um, Angels in America. But I can't think of an example that does that type of narrative storytelling for climate change. Uh I, I cannot readily recall one for climate change. I, I think can't. Partly, partly because, partly because, so that's that's the thing you can do now. Okay, you know? so I gotta go, I gotta go, I'm gonna go work on that. <laughs> you have a few ideas now. I think partly because of, we are struggling with, what does climate change mean, right? We said so many things, whether it is drought in Africa, right? Um, powerful intensive hurricanes in the Gulf, uh, are heavy snowstorms in the Midwest and, and Northeast. So we need to figure out, actually, you are the expert. I don't know why I'm talking to you about this one. You know, you should tell me how we will tell a story, you know, uh, given that you have, uh, you know, you're the filmmaker. Uh, you know, how do we do this? How do we bring this home? Uh, because you, you do this, you know, for your living. Because I don't think we, the way, if, if I talk about global warming, you know, I'm, I have lost half right. the people by that time. You know? Right. I guess Avatar kind of did it, but I think you're right. I think it has to be a singular journey of somebody searching for something universal that speaks to all of us, whether it's identity, security for your family. And there has been examples of that, right? Uh, and because there's versions of that that have done that with immigration. And it has to be about, you know, a, a family or a person's journey to, to survive. Um, and to, to keep the people they love safe under the circumstances and uh, the logistics of what happens and comes from climate change. It looks like you're already working on a plot. I know. Uh, yeah. I mean, but you're right. I, I mean, I think that that's, that's what, one of the reasons I love you know, these conversations because our goal is to humanize it, right? And I think through humanizing it, it does exactly what you so eloquently talked about today, which is the ability to communicate something from a horizontal perspective perspective 
which allows us not to put those defenses up and therefore we can consume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the key is that phrase, humanizing it, bring yeah. it down to, to the level I can understand, you know, where I can relate to it. This problem. Um, pivoting backwards, um, strategies, you know, because we always like to talk about some of this stuff, you know, macro uh, from, a, from a government standpoint, from a, a state standpoint. And maybe we go, let's maybe go macro. Maybe we go from a government standpoint. Now with the new administration, seeing the roles that social media have played as platforms for misinformation, what responsibility, because I don't trust Mark Zuckerberg to, to um, police his own platform. What role does government play in the spread of misinformation uh, in the social media age? So, uh, and I want to be very blunt here. I'm not a politician. Love it. I love blunt. Get it very well, um, and I'm I'm basing it on 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 what I know. Um, the problem we faced, and pandemic is a great example of that. Uh, the problem we faced is that even though we sort of had an evolving consensus on pandemic on the pandemic. It was completely undercut by the previous administration. Right. Mr. Trump, and I'm sorry to say it about the former president of our country, was one of the single, singularly super spreader of this misinformation. So if I'm a regular citizen, what am I supposed to think? On the one hand, people are telling me one thing, the scientists, the environmental movement, the organizations. On the other hand, a person I trust, my president, our administration, is saying something else. Uh, it's very confusing and I start questioning and seeds of doubts are planted. Yep. And social media, if you think about social media, social it, 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 misinformation is not created by social media, right? It is planted by people like us, somebody, and, it, and there is always misinformation. You know, we go back, way back, to advertising history where we had snake oil salesmen selling yep. medicines, right? Yep. Yep. But what happened in this context is whatever that lied in the corner of one place in the internet was picked up and spread out, amplified. You know, so when somebody says something about hydroxychloroquine, the president picks it up, then the mainstream media have no choice but to cover it, right? And that's how you have mainstream misinformation and disinformation. So one advantage we will have now is, and it has already begun, though we don't have evidence yet, it's just new administration, that that will be calmed down. Uh, we won't have somebody who is an authority, you know, whether you agree with that person or not, somebody who is an authority who is going to contradict science all the time was going to contradict public health all the time. To me, that's a huge improvement in the climate of information about climate change or the pandemic, because at the very least, I don't have to get up in the morning and look at Twitter and say, oh my God, I don't know what happened today on Twitter, right? At least I don't do that anymore, you know? So, uh, so that's a huge improvement. And when the president, irrespective of the party, irrespective of the party, and that's why I'm, I'm moving away from partisan politics here. Irrespective of the, when the president and the authority in DC broadly develops a consensus and strives for a consensus on these issues, it will make a huge impact in lowering the temperature and broadening that consensus, I think. So from a national perspective, we have already begun that. So instead of trashing the Paris Agreement, we are saying we'll join the Paris Agreement and we'll work. Whether it will, we might disagree with certain articles, but we will work with that, right? That's a very different approach than trashing it, yep. right? And and so I think we have begun that process at the national level, uh, and and I think if if the conversation is more consensus oriented, with a uh, with a certain degrees of skepticism, but not cynicism, then. Uh, I think, you know, that's a great start at the national level. Yeah, that's great. And I, I'm going to skip state level because I want to go to to the people that are watching this. How do we manage that from an individual standpoint? How do we fight misinformation to ourselves, to our families, 
right. you know, in our in our in our groups. Right. So, uh, I I think this is where uh, um, I I must be honestly say that social media have a bigger role to play than individuals. Now, let me start by saying, it is extremely unreasonable and unfair to impose the burden on individuals to manage misinformation hmm. or, or, or put the onus on them. Here are these powerful social media platforms who are making a lot of money, who have the computational resources, financial resources. They better get their act together. Right now, until today, they have to be brought in kicking and screaming. You know, if you go and look, look back at the history of our criticism of social media from starting with 2016 elections, they did not agree, they did not concede until we had to show evidence that social media platforms were responsible. Yep. You know, the first thing is they have to take responsibility. It is very unfair and unreasonable to put the onus on the individuals. That's the first thing, you know. And, and I, I personally am very skeptical that social media platforms will do this voluntarily, you know. Uh, and so that's something to think about. Now, when it comes to individuals, I tell them, and we have, you know, we have a COVID-19 dashboard on our lab site. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how successful we are. You know, we tell people, right, don't be finger happy, like trigger happy, finger happy, right? It is so easy. I don't even have to read an article. I just see the headline and, and I can share it, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and that somehow making them, stopping them and asking them to think a little bit before they click that finger, right? Uh, I don't know about you, but because of my global work, uh, I am on WhatsApp a lot, right? Now, WhatsApp is such a completely different medium too, because right, all it takes, and, and they all use a very interesting phrase when I see this from family and friends, forwarded as received, right? It's a complete kooky stuff, but forwarded as received, which means I'm not taking responsibility for it. I'm just forwarding it. My question is, why are you forwarding it? This absolutely doesn't make sense, you know? And I have videos I show in my class, which are so ridiculous, right? It's like this James Bond music, movie music, you know, with uh, soldiers going out and shooting people because they're suffering from pandemic. It is so hokey. It is so clearly hokey, but people forward it. Not because I have evil intentions, it's because it's amusing, it's entertaining. It is a way of building that relationship and strengthening that relationship in, within my networks. You know, I want to share this with my family, have a laugh. So it's very difficult at the individual level. So what we have been arguing is, as a person, you don't have to know a lot about climate change on every paper that comes out in a journal every day, just like pandemic. You don't have to know because every day there is a new paper in JAMA or New England Journal of Medicine or Lancet. That's not your problem. What you need to know to do what you want to do today in your life, that's all you need. Don't worry about the latest study, latest finding. And there are some wonderful resources. So we direct them to WHO or to uh, CDC or to their local health department because there is a lot of useful information there. And that's what we need to do. I think, you know, uh, for individuals, provide them with the toolkits uh, to, to go and get the information uh, and train them. Some people have talked about uh, so-called media literacy, you know, trying to, trying to train them in, in skepticism, right, about, and, and it is an interesting thing, but the evidence is a little mixed on that, whether that actually works or not. Because, you know, even I'm thinking of my own behavior, I look at a WhatsApp message, I know it's clearly bad, but it is so funny. Right, and it is so funny. In fact, I, you know, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time going through them, but you know, it's it just so funny. I, said, I laugh at it. I know it is hokey, right? So I think it's a bit difficult at the individual level. You know, so. Trained skepticism is such a good word for that, but I think it's necessary because I think that you know, I was reading the rabbit hole, which is a, a piece that New York Times is like a six-piece article on on the algorithm created by the French scientists that is training your body to go deeper into that rabbit hole. 
And I see it with all my friends, my dad, who's one of the smartest people I know and this incredible professor. And he'll, he'll, he'll start off on the New York Times. And by the end of it, he'll be on some website that's like peddling him cinnamon from, from God knows where and entering a credit card. And I'm like, and then he reads me some title. I go, what? Are, where are you reading? And he's like, it's the New York Times. And I go, no. And I go and look, and he's seven clicks away from the New York Times from some sidebar. So I think that there is trained skepticism is important because there is so much misinformation. And I think that is that does come to an individual level, right. which is understanding where it is you're piecing, you're, you're piecing right. your information right. um, it, it, from. Do yeah. you want to talk a little bit about, because I don't think people know what that is, um, what the, the dashboard. Yeah, um, so what we found out uh, when um, the pandemic was emerging uh, in January and February, uh, there was a lot of misinformation, a lot of disinformation, and a lot of confusion, especially as you know, it was evolving science, right? Yep. Uh, what we knew in January 2020 compared to what we know now, uh, you know, we, we know a lot more now than we did a year ago. So, in, so we work a lot with community partners at the grassroots level. Uh, we work with them. Uh, anytime we do research, we are working closely with them to define the problem and define the solutions. And, and we have been hearing from our partners that which there is a lot of confusion in the community about what to do, what not to do. One day, CDC said, don't use the mask, you know, uh, spare them uh, for the frontline workers. And now they're telling us, use the mask. And in my community, there are people who can't afford to uh, buy masks. What do we do? So there was this confusion. And also, um, because we work with communities where uh, we have a, you know, uh, uh, people who are immigrants or, or people from minority communities, uh, they were also suffering a lot. You know, they were, uh, you know, from pandemic, they were contracting it more quickly. There were deaths. So at that point, we decided um, we will collect. We, it's not uh, fair to have them go through and sift the wheat from the shaft, so to speak. You know. So we said we will do that. So we created a dashboard, a simple dashboard, uh, nothing original. We got all the reliable information from different places and put them up in in very simple layperson terms. You know, frequently asked questions, myths versus facts. Uh, where do you go for reliable information? Which are the three, four sources you want to go to if you want more? Uh, and we started it in English. Um, um, and then uh, because we work with a lot of immigrants from who are Spanish speaking, so we created a Spanish version, then a Portuguese version because Massachusetts has a lot of immigrants from Brazil. Uh, and so we had a Portuguese version. And since I work in India, we have a Hindi version. Uh, so it's a very simple, uh, a curation of factual messages uh, around the pandemic, which we frequently update uh, with the hope that we can uh, at least uh, stem this misinformation impact on people if they want it. And we work with journalists and community partners uh, to, to disseminate that information. Yeah, I think I pulled off a, there's a John Hopkins Rockefeller Foundation study on transmission of student to student with the best kind of protocol in place and testing and how many times per week. And I was just email blasting that to teachers and people I know that were running schools. And I think, did, did you, I don't know if I pulled it off of the dashboard or not, but that new Norwegian study now that talks about transmission of, of, of child to child and under the right circumstances of protocol. No, I, I'm not. I haven't followed that. You know? Well, I think I think it. I think what it, regardless, like this is the thing that has been a beacon because I have so many friends that are wildly intelligent that just pull a piece of information here and pull a right. piece of information right. there, and all of a sudden they're talking about, you know, right. uh, basically right. is a conspiracy theory. Right. Right. Um, Thank you for that. I, I I don't have any further questions. I mean, that was this is one of my favorite because I think that. I do really believe in the power of great communications to overcome and solve great obstacles. Um, and I think that, you know, when, when I, as again, I talk about it with my seven-year-old and my four-year-old is when things go sideways and we've got obstacles, we, that's when we double down on our communication and our empathy to figure out a way and a path forward for, for the best of all of us. Um, and that's what, what you're doing. Um, 
do you have anything else that you that you think that is there any questions I should be asking or uh, anything that you want to talk about? No, I think you were very sharp in the way you questioned me. I think the only thing I can say is certainly communication is important, not because both of us are in this area in a different ways, you know, but at the end of the day, I think creating that sympathy, that empathy, that, that sense of belonging uh, and, and obligation uh, is absolutely critical, I think. You know, otherwise, we are, in a, uh, we are in trouble, actually. We are in trouble, you know, um, and, and we need to really get this right. And you talked about your children, and you know the other thing is, you know, we need to really remember uh, we have to pay forward. We were lucky uh, that our parents and grandparents took care of us, uh, yeah. took care of the environment. So I think the obligation, I the question I have for people is now, how do we pay it forward? Yeah. Uh, you know, for the children, I think you know. So that's very important, and maybe that's where the hope lies. You know, so.